It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you all for coming uh, right after lunch. So it's my uh, goal to keep you entertained and also tell you a little bit about work that I've been doing with uh, Alessandro Achille, who, would, who could not be here. He's uh, interning with uh, DeepMind. Uh, and so uh, I forget what title is in the program, but this is what I will talk about today. I will talk about uh, a theory that describes how some properties that are desirable emerge surprisingly out of processes that don't have them ingrained. Now, uh, I, I'm told that it's no longer cool to talk about deep learning, so this is invalence and disentanglement, differentially programmable representations. <laughs> um, and so, also, because I, uh, part of the stock was given at an IPS symposium on disentanglement, and I sat through it, and it's not clear that anybody knows what that means, so I'll, I'll call it just independence, because I think it's clear. And uh, since invariance is also a hotly disputed or contended word, I'll spend a couple of minutes telling you my history with this word. Uh, it started uh, with the, the day I was um, defending my undergraduate thesis, and in the audience was a famous MIT professor named Sanjoy Mitter, and at the end of an hour-long talk, the only thing he said was, uh, there must be some invariance. I had no idea what that meant, uh, but it sounded interesting, so I started looking into that. That was 1991. Uh, and then the following year, I ran into a paper titled, The Non-Existence of General Case View Invariance. So it didn't look like a promising direction, and that was the first invariance winter. Um, and so, uh, but it turns out, actually, that thanks to the work of some of the people who may not be in the room, but uh, first of all, Ganesh Sundaramurthy was a postdoc, then Peter Peterson and uh, uh, Varadarajan in the math department, that in fact, yes, there are invariant, and yes, you can construct them, and in fact, not only they exist, but you can actually show that they are maximal invariant, meaning that there are functions, and I will say in a second what invariants do, that are as good as the data, okay, modulo or minus the effect of nuisances, which for instance, could, for images, could be viewpoint and illumination and so on and so forth. So the problem is that, and just to remind you, uh, this talk about learning, but I come from computer vision, and if you think of your brain as roughly the size of your two hands, roughly half of, half of it is processing visual information. Okay, so right now, most of your uh, real estate in your brain is trying to figure out what's coming on from the optic nerve. And so for images, it turns out that the construction uh, does not include non-invertible nuisances, and occlusions are one of the most fundamental phenomenologies of image formation. So if you have an image and something is occluded, there's nothing you can do to the image to invert that process and get what's behind the occlusion. So that was, to me, the second invariance winter. And I kind of left that uh, uh, thread for a while. Okay. And this was all before deep learning. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, and so there was a period of, uh, of uh, despair, symbolized by this blank slide. <laughs> uh, it, it happens in academia. And so, and that's where I started focusing on the task. Forget about this very complicated uh, equation here, but I was then interested in a notion of complexity, not of the data, but of the data after you throw away stuff that doesn't matter. And because in images, most of the complexity of the images is due to nuisance factors, it turns out that this object is very, very small. And it turns out that this quantity that I was looking to compute and optimize is completely equivalent to the information bottleneck, which is a notion that goes back to Naftali Tishbi to 1999. And it's a very compelling notion in the sense that if you're interested in something, let's say a task, could be detection, recognition, categorization, localization of objects and images, could be a control task, could be a decision task, and you have data, let's say images or some type of sensory data up to time t, okay, and you are interested in something, some representation, right, that is informative of the task, then Tishby argues that you should minimize this quantity, I'll come back to that, but this quantity entails throwing away information. This symbol stands for mutual information, which is something that I was very uneasy with because one of my mentors back in the 90s said that his mother always told him to never throw away information. <laughs> so I was very taken aback because somebody here was whispering in my ear, never throw away information, and then Tishby was saying, no, no, you have to throw away as much information as possible. Okay, so this is just to set the stage that some of these concepts come and go over the years. And uh, uh, sometimes they come back, and sometimes they come back in the right way, okay? So I hope to convince you that 
these concepts are not incompatible. And in fact, hopefully, these ups and downs invariants exist. No, yes, no, yes. Uh, and so we'll, we'll come to clear to that. Okay? And for me, the starting point was to move from maximal invariance to sufficient invariance. And I'll make that clear. Okay, so that's menu for the, for the day. So even if you understood nothing of what I said so far, we're going to start from scratch. Okay? <laughs> All right, that was just a preamble. All right. Okay, so what I would like to do today is I would like to talk about representations. Representations are, in the most general sense, functions of the data that are useful for a task. Okay? It's what you want to store in memory instead of all the data. Okay? And so, uh, for, of, of all the possible functions you can construct, I want to describe the ones that I think would be ideal or optimal in some sense. Okay? And this is basic principle of statistical decision information theory. Okay? These are not ideas that I invented. Okay? This should be straightforward. Now, in deep learning today, we do stuff that at face value has nothing to do with this. Okay? So I will describe the practice, the, the real workhorses of deep learning, which, has, which are SGD and GSD. SGD stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent, GSD for Graduate Student Descent. So these are the two things that make uh, deep learning work. Uh, and then what I find most surprising is that these two things are actually related in the sense that in the process of doing this, we actually achieve some of the desirable properties that we started with at the outset. And this work started in 2000, well, in 2005 for me, really before deep learning came along, and the fact that what we do in deep learning has actually something to do with that was a surprise to me. Okay? So that's the menu for the day. Okay? All right. Okay, so let me make it a little more precise. I'll call the data X in an outburst of creativity. I'll call the task Y. So these are random variables. Okay? Uh, y could be a binary value. Is there a person in the room, yes or no? I should say, is there a cat in the room, yes or no? Um, or it could be a continuous variable, a control, uh, uh, a control uh, or it could be X itself, if you want to do autoencoding or compression. So it, this is very general at this, uh, at this level, okay? Everything, the equations I will write are, for simplicity purposes, assume that Y is an element of discrete set, but everything can be derived in the infinite dimensional setting, okay? So, you're given the data, that's typically not your choice. You typically have a task, and what you would like to, uh, the question of representation is, can I construct a function of the data, okay, that is useful for the task in the sense that it is as informative of the task as the data itself, it cannot be more informative than the data, you cannot create information by torturing the data, but you would like it to be as informative as the data, okay, but also, there's stuff that happens to the data that has nothing to do with the task, and you would like your representation to be independent of that. Okay, so these are called nuisance variables. Okay. So, just to put names to things, so a representation is sufficient for the task if it is as informative as the data. Okay, so I want to, at the very least, not throw away any information about the task. Ideally, I would like it to be invariant to nuisances, or at least maximally insensitive. I don't want it to depend on things I don't care about. Okay? And I would like it to be as simple as possible, minimal in some sense, and I would like it to be as easy to work with as possible. Okay? So, oops, sorry. Um, okay? So these are the basic principles that I would like a representation to have. Now, uh, Deterministic functions of the data that are sufficient are called sufficient statistics. They always exist. The data is, is one case. Minimal sufficient statistics exist in finite dimension only for the exponential family. So this is typically an avenue that people have not followed because other than for the exponential family, if you are able to compute these functions, they're typically infinite dimensional. Okay? So not very many people, when we started looking at this in 2000 and 2009 to 11, were not looking for minimal or approximations of minimal sufficient statistics. Okay. So, Bahadur 1954 shows that the likelihood function is minimal sufficient. Now, it's a function, so it's infinite dimensional. What does it mean for it to be minimal? There's a bit of measure theory involved there. But roughly speaking, you can write a formula. You just cannot compute it. Okay. And so, um, for a while, we were working very hard to try to find these functions. And for some simple cases, we can 
actually write them in closed form. But when you try them for more complicated cases, you very quickly hit a wall. And that's where uh, Alessandro Achille came along. He was a graduate student starting in 2005 and said, you should not look for deterministic functions of the data. You should look for stochastic functions of the data. And also, you should measure complexity not by dimensionality, but by information. And so you should look for stuff that lives in very high dimensional spaces that is very stochastic. And that may make your life easier, both in terms of computation and analysis. And that was a turning point. Okay. And so, uh, let me now formalize these notions. So remember, we want functions of the data that are sufficient, invariant, minimal, and in addition, we want them to be easy to work with. So ideally, if this is a random vector, we want the components to be independent, okay? Is there any objection to at least this set of prescriptions? Okay. Because it's not innocuous, so it has consequences. For instance, whether something is sufficient depends on the task. So if you don't give me the task, there's nothing I can tell you about a representation. The only viable representation, if you give me the task, is to store everything. Because no existence in the unsupervised regime? Here, it's supervised and supervised doesn't matter. The task, you pick the task. The task could be X itself, so compression, it's unsupervised. Could be prediction, could be control, right? So I'm not, I'm not assuming that anything is supervised here, okay? So biologists resist the fact that you have to specify a task as the, at the outset. But the reality is that if you tell me nothing about the task, tomorrow you could come back and say, I want to know the value of pixel 3 in, in, in image 7. And if you didn't store the data, you wouldn't be able to, to solve that. OK, so, okay, so how do we measure sufficiency? So a stochastic function z of x is sufficient of x for y if the information it contains about the task is the same than information the data contains about the task. So you don't throw away any information on the data, okay? Yep. So, on, the, so on, on this um, topic, is, you, you assume that the task is known or is it, or you would like to find a representation that is maybe valid for a family. So I have not said anything about uniqueness, meaning that I have not said that the representation has to be or, or should be unique, right? There could be infinitely many. Yeah. All I ask is that it is sufficient, invariant, minimal, and disentangled. And in fact, there are infinitely many. Yes. No, no, for example, let's say that there was a solve by kind of like this regression. Yes. So the condition of mean would be testing out the prejudice, right? So that would be defined as a sufficient uh, minimal right. invariant for this regression. Right. So now if I change the task a little bit. Yes. So, right. So your question is, for those of you who didn't hear it, is what if you change the task? Everything I say assumes that you tell me what the task is, and I will tell you what the optimal representation is. Now, if you want to use that representation for a different task, as in transfer learning domain adaptation, there is nothing that I can guarantee for you. So this is not about uh, transfer learning or domain adaptation. This theory does not offer anything for that problem. But we're working on it. OK. OK, so sufficiency, are we all OK with that? OK. Invariance, if you have a random variable that is independent of the task, then you would like the representation to be independent of it, so to contain no information about that. Okay, or at least you would like this number to be as small as possible. Now, minimal means that the information that Z, that the representation contains about the data, is as small as possible, in the sense that so long as it is sufficient, so it keeps what it needs about the task, you can throw away as much as possible about the data. Okay? And this entangle, if z is a random vector, you would like the components to be as independent of each other as possible. So this quantity has different names. It's called vector mutual information or multi-information or total correlation. It's zero when your vector z has components that are all independent of each other. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so these are properties that I would like. Okay? I have no idea how to compute anything that has these properties, but if I could, then I would be happy that this is what I would call an optimal representation. Not the optimal, there's no uniqueness prescription, but an optimal representation, okay? All right, so now you can formalize this into an optimization problem. You can say by manipulating some of this mutual information, you want to minimize the, uh, the relative entropy between uh, of the task given the representation. So this one is zero if the representation predicts the task perfectly. And then you want to, uh, sorry, this is minus sign here. You want to, no, no, with the plus sign minimize. You want to minimize the information that the representation contains about the data, and you want to minimize total correlation. 
Okay? So if you could solve this big variational problem with respect to all possible probability laws of Z, of representations given the data, then you'll be in business. Okay? So now, let me focus on two properties, sufficiency and minimality. Let, let me forget about independence for now. Okay? Let's just focus on these two. Okay? So if I write these two, first of all, I get for free the third, in the sense that you can prove that given sufficiency, minimality is equivalent to invariance. Okay? In the sense that there's an inequality, and you can always construct one case where that is uh, uh, inequality. Okay? So in other words, given sufficiency, if you throw away everything else, then you get invariance. Or if you are invariance, then you're minimal. Okay? All right? So, okay, so we have three properties. And let me hold on to the fourth. I'll come back to that. Okay? All right, so this is what I would like to do. And this has nothing to do with deep learning. I'm not telling you how to compute these uh, representations. So let me spend five minutes on what we actually do in deep learning, and then let's see if that's any relation between the two. Okay, before I move on, any questions on this? So any disagreement that this, these properties are desirable? Yes? So the task is a random variable that you specify. It could be a binary random variable that takes 0, 1. And uh, the representation is a function that is informative of the random variable so that when you have a test datum, okay, you don't have it yet, but you will, you compute the representation of that. And that you can use instead of the datum to maximally reduce the uncertainty of your task variable. Okay, now if you want to threshold that and get a decision, that would be a classifier, you can do that. Or if it's a regression, you would get a set of parameters. Or if it's a control function, you would get an element of a function space. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK. All right. OK, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about what we do in deep learning or in differentiable programming. OK, so uh, now everything that I've talked about so far are properties of the test datum. So I would like a representation that is invariant to nuisance variability of data I have not yet seen. Because data I have, I can pre-process, I can do everything I want. But I want invariance, minimality, sufficiency as a function of the test data. I haven't seen that yet. Okay? So I, I don't even know how to compute those quantities. But what I do know is that if you give me a data set, D, okay, I have to think of D as a random variable here even though you get one instance of it. Then you can think of a parametric class of functions, let's say a deep neural network, that you, uh, with respect to which you optimize a functional, let's say cross entropy. Okay, you get a set of weights, and these weights, you can think of them as a representation of the data set. So now the weights are a representation of past data, okay, of, of the data set. Now, this has nothing to do with the representations I've talked about thus far, okay? All right. OK, so now, if you massage the cross entropy term, OK, so this is the cross entropy between the true distribution that, from which you sample the data set and the model distribution, which is a parametric class of functions that depends on parameter w that you're looking for, you can decompose it into a bunch of positive terms. And this term, which is the information, the weights contained about the data set, if you are given the true state of nature. OK? This is the only negative term. If this term wasn't there, then minimizing an empirical approximation of that would force you to minimize each and every single term, and then you would be in business. But instead, what you can do to reduce this term is you can store all the data set into the weights, make this term big, that becomes small, everybody's happy. This is called overfitting, except that nothing works. OK? So what would you like to do? Well, ideally, if you add to the empirical cross-entropy this term, then everything is positive, and then you're in business. No overfitting, except that this term is, is intractable. You don't, know this, you don't know the true state of nature, so you cannot do this. But if you replace this with anything that upper bounds it, for instance, removing conditioning on the true state of nature, right? then you get a functional that 
is positive, and so you're forced to minimizing all the components of it, and this would not overfit. Now, this thing looks a lot like an information bottleneck, and it is an information bottleneck. It is an information bottleneck where the weights are a representation of the training set, okay, which is sufficient for the task of approximating the true distribution. Okay? It is not the information bottleneck that Tishby was talking about or that other people have, have written papers recently about. It is the information bottleneck for the weights. Okay? Now, instantiating this is, is a bit tricky because the data set, you get one sample of it. You don't get distribution of data sets, but it can be done. Okay? And until a few years ago, we didn't know how to actually minimize this thing, but now with stochastic gradient variational Bayes, thanks to King Mind Welling, we actually can minimize that. So it's interesting that there is another information bottleneck, but it's not clear how it's connected to the properties that I described before, because they're actually disconnected. You know, this talks about the past, talks about the training set, but the properties I want are properties or representation of the test data, okay, or future data. Any questions on this? Okay. So this is an information bottleneck of the weights. Okay. Now, one interesting bit is that, so if you believe in Tishby, then in the information bottleneck, you're trying to minimize the information that the weights contain about the data set. So there's a paper of Jeff Hinton in, from 1993 where it talks about network compression, and it says we should minimize the information that the weights contain about the data set. At the time, nobody knew how to do that, but that's actually the right intuition. So if you can do that, then you actually guarantee generalization. Except, how do you connect this with the desirable property? So I'm gonna come back to that. Now the other problem is that what we do in deep learning is actually not this. We don't have the second term. People just minimize empirical cross-entropy with SGD or variance of SGD. Plus, you know, dropout, plus uh, pooling, plus, uh, you know, striding and all that. Okay? So, I'm going to spend two slides, for those of you who are not at Pratik's, Pratik Chaudhary's talk this morning, because it turns out that even if this term is not there, when you do stochastic gradient descent, it is actually there. Okay, you just don't know it. Okay, and so I'm gonna switch notation. I like to do that two or three times in a talk so that the audience becomes notation invariant. <laughs> and, and you really get the ideas, not, not the symbols, but this is actually to connect to Pratik's talk because despite being my student, I cannot convince him to use my notation, so he wants, which is a great sign. You should always refuse your advisor's suggestions. Okay, so, so what, what you saw hopefully this morning is that you can think of a continuum version of SGD as a stochastic differential equation. It has a diffusion term. To that, there, con, there correspond a Fokker-Planck equation that uh, tells you how the density over the weights condition of the data set evolves. Okay, that's exactly the quantity that we are interested in. And then what he showed is that in the Wasserstein metric, if you minimize empirical cross-entropy, you're actually minimizing something that has another term, so if F is your empirical cross-entropy, uh, sorry, if E of S is your empirical cross-entropy or approximation, then you get this entropic term there. So that term is exactly the information the weights contain about the data set. Okay, so that to me is, is, is almost crazy because nobody was thinking of, of, of this when, you know, SGD was derived out of complexity considerations and, and simplicity, not, out of regularization or generalization or, or, or anything like that. You have a question? It was or it was not? It was, okay, yeah, yeah. So, but... No, no, I said it was conceived, not considered. Right. 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 So I, I use the word conceived, right? So I don't think it was conceived with generalization ideas in mind or information complexity in mind, right? Is that not a fair statement? That, is that misleading? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Renew it has a good effect on SCTA. After you tried it, yes. Right. Okay, so let me put it. Everybody knew that SGD had phenomenal generalization, and everybody knew that the way, the reason it was doing it is because it reduced information in the weights. That Not. Part, no, but, uh, <laughs> Sure, okay, fair enough. So, so uh, the properties, I mean, here I'm not uh, amazed by the properties of SGD. I'm amazed by the fact that this added term has exactly the same form as that. Okay, I don't think anybody knew that. At least I didn't. That's fair? Okay. Okay, so, uh, but still I have not made the connection with the properties of a representation that I started with because ultimately that's what I'm interested in. Okay. All right, so, um, and, and here's the main claim. Uh, so this is for one layer, but you can extend it to multiple layers. It's not a tight bound for multiple layers. Basically, if you can train a network, okay, so that you achieve sufficiency, you know, okay? And now, of course, you can do that with overfitting, but if you do that while minimizing the information the weights contain about the data set, so if you're able to minimize this term, then automatically you bound the information that the representation of the test datum contains about the test datum and total correlation. And you sandwich on both sides. Okay, so in a sense, you are playing with the information the weights contain about the data set, which is past data, and you get the desirable properties you want it for the test data. Sorry, did I say test data? Training data and test data, okay? So this is not an information theory result. This is a deep learning result because to prove that, you need to use the structure of ConvNets, the way weights and activations are coupled. And for many layers, it's not a tight bound because you don't know where the information gets distributed. It could be that it's all captured in the first layer or only in the last or evenly, so it's not tight, but you still have the same property. Yes? Uh, so you need the linear coupling between weights, weights and activation within each layer, and then you need the Markov property. You need a Markov property, right? So then you know we can answer questions about uh, you know dense nets and, and res nets and things like that. But we can, if you want, we can take it offline. Okay. So is is that clear? So the reason why this is called emergence theory is because you are operating in this space, and you get these properties to emerge in a way that was not. Uh, explicit, at least. Okay. So that's, uh, I think, where we are in the sense that, at least in terms of understanding where these properties comes, come about, I think it's quite fascinating how two ends that started really from completely different purposes, one was to build representations of the test datum, and the, one, the other one was generalization sort of come together. So there you have all four desirable properties. Okay. Now, uh, any other questions on this or clarifications on history? Okay. All right. So uh, now, as I said, um, everything. So the formulas that I wrote involve mutual informations, which require you to have a model, and now you cannot write it for continuous random variables. But it turns out that you can rederive everything in the framework of pack base. Okay. So then you don't necessarily require to have discrete random variables. You can do it for continuous random variables. And this was actually pointed out to us by David McAllister uh, in a long email thread. And then Dan Roy and uh, Carolina Dugazza also uh, have very interesting work uh, in this area. Uh, it turns out that if you restrict the class of functions to be deterministic functions of the data, so you drop the stochasticity, then if a representation uh, minimizes the information in the weights, it also maximizes actionable information, which is the complexity of a maximal invariant with respect to nuisance variability, which is what we were studying in 2005 to 2009. So the circle closes. <laughs>
Um, Let's see, do I want to get into flat minima? I think Pratik talked about flat minima today, so I will skip that. Maybe I'll just mention that this is a loose bound. It, uh, it's probably vacuous as well, but I'll mention the fact that if you, have, if you manage to converge to a flat minimum, one that has a nuclear norm of the Hessian that's, very, that's, that's small, then you bound uh, from above the information in the weight. So that also contributes. And in general, there's many ways for you to reduce this term. You can do it with the architecture by pooling, downsampling, and so on and so forth. You can do it by regularization with, max, with uh, dropout, variational dropout, information dropout. You can do it by converging to, local, to flat minima. You can do it with SGD. So there's many ways of slicing that cake. But the important quantity is, is, is that one. And I, I don't think that. Uh, so um, there's, uh, <laughs> there was this uh, contentious paper by Ben Recht and, and friends at ICLR last year, I think, where it says uh, uh, neural networks require thinking generalization. So we repeated that experiment. You remember the, the information bottleneck Lagrangian that had a beta term there. And so people run experiment that mean the mind where they, they say, oh, you know, really beta should not be one, like uh, uh, variational Bayes predicts, but it should be bigger, bigger than one. Why should it be bigger than one and so on and so forth. So it turns out there is actually a phase transition that the theory predicts exactly at beta is equal to one, which is this sharp discontinuity. So let me explain this plot. So we repeated the same experiment, took random labels, uh, this is CIFAR, I think, took random labels, trained, except that we train for different sizes of the sets and different amount of information in the weights, okay, governed by beta. And so it turns out that for any amount of information in the weights, you can always find a big enough data set that you will underfit, so the residual is large, okay, but vice versa, for any data set, you can allow the weights to have enough information that you will overfit. But there's nothing in between. There's no generalization. There's a very sharp phase transition exactly at the boundary beta is equal to one. And this actually also relates to learning rate, so you can predict the learning rate. Whereas if you do it on real labels, you see that you don't have blue here, so provided that you allow enough complexity, right, even for larger data sets, you still don't see any blue here, and this is where you can generalize. So this is exactly the same data. And if you, one of the uh, plots that this I, I got from Ben Recht, he argues, well, you know, uh, there's a bias variance trade-off and, and ConvNet or big deep network should be over here because they have billions of parameters, yet they generalize, why is that? Well, if you model, if you measure model complexity by number of parameters, then yes, they should be here. But if you model it by the information in the weight, it, you get exactly the minimal weight it's supposed to be. So there's no inconsistency. Yep. So uh, when you have the uh, regularization, so there's many ways of minimizing uh, of, uh, so, so that, uh, that infor the information in the weight can be uh, computed by injecting noise into the activations and controlling the amount of noise that you inject into the activations. So this is for a particular noise model, which is log normal. And the covariance of the log normal uh, is the amount of information, uh, one over, over the covariance, the amount of information in the weight. The more noise you inject in the activation, sorry, the more noise you inject in the activation, the less information you have in the weights. So you control that. So you can actually, that's why you can uh, generate this plot. In this plot, every single point is the residual of a convnet taken to convergence. So this took months to get. Okay. Does it make sense? So you inject noise, and you control how much noise you inject. The more noise you inject, the less information. Okay. okay. So um, I come from controls. So ultimately, the interest to build systems that interact with the environment, not just to take the data and give you the best possible function of the data for you to store. Okay. I'm also interested in the question of how do we get the best data. Okay. And so uh, I'm heading back to control problem, and to me, one of the central tenets of control that has enabled uh, us to send rockets to the moon uh, has been the separation principle. The fact that there is a function of the data, which in controls it calls a state, which you store, which is as good as a state for closing a control loop or for predicting one step ahead. And so that statistic, it's called the Markov splitting statistic, contains all, past, all the information of past data for the purpose of control. And it works for linear system with Gaussian noise and nothing else. Okay, but it's very powerful because 
if you can get that, then you can say, okay, you're a control theorist or a control engineer. You worry about control. I give you the state. You don't need to ask me anything else. And I need to worry about how to construct that state. So we're working on trying to develop something similar, and it turns out it's not impossible. Uh, but essentially, the question we're asking is, is there a separating statistic, a separating representation, given which you can exercise control without having to store the data? It's sort of the analogous of the state. And, and there is, and so we are now kind of uh, heading upwards, but it's a steep uh, incline, and so here I have pictures of the people who influenced me. And uh, the, the little toy car here is close to Pratik because I think that he stands the best chance to take us up this uh, steep incline. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>